In today's video, we're gonna learn the proper timing of all the major Highland bagpipe embellishments. Stay tuned. Well, hello everybody, I'm Matt Willis Bagpiper, and on this channel I make videos to make you a stronger and more confident piper. If you like this kind of content, please think about giving the video a like and subscribing to the channel. I also teach Skype and online lessons if you want more personalized instruction, but more on that later. There are many limitations on the Highland bagpipes, first of which there are only nine notes in total on the instrument. Yes, we can kind of cross finger a few accidentals here and there, but the meat and potatoes, the bulk of the music we play has only nine notes. We also cannot control the dynamics or the volume of those notes. That's not to say there is no dynamics on the instrument. That actually isn't true. On the Highland pipes, the low notes, low G and low A in particular, are quite bold and very, very loud. The higher notes, like high G and high A, are actually somewhat quiet, at least in relationship to those low notes. So as you go up the scale, you go from loud, low, to relatively quiet, high. So there are dynamics in the instrument. We just don't get to control which notes they occur on. But people smarter than me were able to take this very concept and put together combinations of notes and grace notes into specific patterns that we call embellishments that allow us to have more dynamics be psychoacoustically possible than would otherwise be on our limited scale. Man, that was a lot of syllables. In any case, it makes our music sound like it does. It gives it the breadth and feeling and all of the things that, well, we love about Highland piping but it can be quite confusing. The ornaments are all written out just as series of grace notes all beamed together, and there's not a lot of information being conveyed about how they should be timed or played. So I came up with this poster right here where I have all of the major Highland bagpipe embellishments written out, and in addition, it shows how they relate to the beat and how they are properly timed. If you're interested in purchasing this poster, there's a link down below where you can get your own copy of this. It's available in a canvas wrap, as you see here, or as just a poster, which you can have framed. It also goes down to a 9 by 11 size, which is perfect for the cover of a binder. But enough of the sales pitch right now. Let's get back to talking about this. For the vast majority of our grace notes, they fall into three different, well, categories or families. There is the embellishments that start on the beat. These are going to be our doublings, our strikes, our triplings, our burls. Then there's the family of embellishments that end on the beat and they take their time from the note before. This is going to include grips and tar lewis primarily. And in addition to that, there are the embellishments that take time from both sides of the embellishment. They take some of it from before and some of it after, these being the D throw in both its light and heavy form. For each of the embellishments that we're talking about today, there is a link down below to a video where I discuss how to properly play each and every one of those. So please check that out if you want to have detailed instruction about how to play these ornaments. That's beyond the scope of this particular video. This one is about organizing them into these different groups and helping you start to see how they fit into the pipe music that you're playing. You can see by how this tree is organized, I did my best to kind of branch out from how they are related to one another. On this poster, all of the notes and sounding tones that are taking place before the beat are represented by kind of a deep red color, as well as kind of a red background behind the staff. You'll see that for beat two, all of the notes and sounding tones are represented by green, either a darker green for the notes themselves or kind of a green background. So you can visually see what is the first beat and what is the second beat, what's happening before the beat and after the beat, doing my best to kind of organize it in that kind of regard there. All high G lifting grace notes in this are represented with kind of a neon yellow green color. Throughout this poster, you'll see that all E grace notes are represented by a pink grace note. All D grace notes are represented by an orange grace note. You'll see that all tapping and sweeping grace notes are represented by blue grace notes. The occasional B grace note, which is more common than you might think, is represented by kind of a tan colored grace note. The first branch of this tree we're going to discuss is the doublings branch. This is going to include doublings, of course, as well as half doublings. These are embellishments that do not have their initial G grace note because we're coming from a high note where that's not possible. But it also includes strikes, which are a form of doubling. We're just separating it with a tapping or striking motion rather than another lifting motion. It also includes triplings, which are just a very convoluted type of doubling that, well, 
goes three times. We have a grace note, a grace note, and a tap to separate the note into three. But you will see, looking at this graphic, that the high A doubling and the high G doubling are not included in this particular family. We'll discuss why shortly, but it'll all make sense as we go through this. In today's video, we're going to be demonstrating each one of these ornaments both on the practice channel here with a metronome, as well as having a digital recreation on Highland Pipes so you can hear a computer play it back with digital MIDI perfection to hear that, yes, indeed, this is how and where they should fall against the beat. So let's start with the first example we see on here that is an A to a C doubling. And at full speed. For this particular example, I'm doing a low A to a C doubling, but the concept is the same regardless of the doubling we're talking about here. You can hear that that low A that we started with is taking nearly all of that first beat. We're going to shave off just the tiniest little bit at the end to give time for that G grace note. We want that G grace note that we're switching from low A to C with to start just before the beat and it will close that finger down exactly when that metronome clicks. So it feels like the G grace note is on the beat, though technically it's just before ending on the beat. And you can see that in the graphic. Then once we're on the C, we're going to separate it with a D grace note. You can see that the C we land on, however, is longer than either the G grace note that we played to get there or the D grace note that we're going to use to separate it. So while they're all written with grace notes, not all of these grace notes have the same value. So the C in a C doubling is a type of grace note I call a sounding tone. This is a real note that is being represented by a grace note. It's much easier to read these three grace notes put together into one group than it would be to write them all out separately, but it doesn't do a great job of communicating which note is longer. And now for the digital version. If you find that you want to place this ornament before the beat, it's super easy to do. Just understand that's not where it falls. Um, da da. The grace note separating those two C's is after the beat, not on the beat. We're going to emphasize the beat with that G grace note and then separate it with the second grace note, in this case, a D. I also want to note that the C after the ornament is not a full beat long. We're spending that entire beat doing something to emphasize the C, but the embellishment itself is taking a not insignificant amount of time away from the C that we land on. So, as we can see in this graphic, the A before it is actually longer than the C. At least the one C. If we again add up the C doubling in its entirety, yes, it is one beat. But the C we land on after it's all done is shorter because we had to subtract the timing of the C doubling itself. Now let's look at the half doubling. This is very, very similar to the one we just did. The difference being that because we're coming from a higher note, we are not going to play the initial G grace note because it's not possible in this case. In this example, we're doing a high A to a B doubling. So that's going to be high A down to B and then separating it with the D. We're going to land on that B smartly on the down, exactly on the beat. Let's give that a go. As before, the B we land on after the half B doubling is going to be shorter than the A because there's the ornament itself subtracting some of the time away. Next, we're going to talk about the D strike, though this does include strikes in general, the two most common being D and B, though strikes are possible from every note from low A up to high A in some capacity. But today, we're going to deal with the D strike. With the D strike, we're starting on a D in this case. We're going to shave just the tiniest little bit at the end of that initial D for the G grace note so that it lands on the beat. Then we'll be on the D sounding tone, the one within the embellishment itself. Then we're going to be tapping all three down for a quick low G to separate that D into two. So again, the strike embellishment is a form of doubling, just one that involves a strike or tapping motion to separate. Given the tapping motion of this ornament, 
Many people want to put that on the beat. It seems to make sense. They want to go bum da da, bum da da. It's bum da da. Someone once said it's kind of like the word button or baton. You want this to be button. Hmm, button, and not hmm, baton. Start your D strikes on the beat. That's going to go for everything on this side of the tree. Finally, we're going to talk about the tripling. Now, the tripling is kind of like a doubling and a strike combined. So I have them kind of branching off at around the same point. I did my best to kind of organize this in some way that was both aesthetically pleasing and hopefully somewhat informative. But it's going to be a doubling followed by a tapping motion so that we can separate the note we're landing on into three, hence called a tripling, though it's also called a hornpipe shake or a doubling strike or a pele or a hubbada. There's a ton of names for this guy. I'm going to call it a tripling. Given the length of this ornament, you can hear there's even less final note after the embellishment than the other examples because we're having to separate two sounding tones out of it. D, 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 D. D, 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 D. And again, the piano roll, as it's called, shows you the approximate amount of time that we're spending on each part of the embellishment. We're going to stay on the side of the tree where we're starting on the beat and going after and going down the burl branch. Now you can see on the burl branch, it very quickly veers over to three different types of burls, but it also includes the high A doubling. So let's start there. Why is the high A doubling in with the burls? Well, my thought is it's not played like the other doublings. We're landing smartly on that initial high A and then separating it most typically with some sort of sweeping motion. Yes, I'm aware there are pipers that tap that particular ornament. I was taught to sweep it. All of the workshops I've been to save one instructor told me to sweep that finger as I was learning as a beginner and I've never once been told, hey, you're doing that wrong. So I'm gonna keep sweeping my high A to separate it in the high A doubling. And just like we're going to do with the burl here in a moment where we're going to sweep our curl or do something with our pinky, for our high A doubling, we're going to sweep our thumb on the back. So to me, it seemed more like a half burl than a doubling, even if we call it a high A doubling. Yes, there are absolutely two high A's in it. We're going to be on an E, go to high A smartly on the beat, and then immediately sweep that thumb so that we separate the A into two. The first burl I want to discuss is the burl from a note other than low A. We will get to that one in just a second. I want to start with the burl that's shown here, E, down to this burl. Now the burl is all about sounding three consecutive A's using sweeping or some sort of motion over the bottom pinky hole. So we want sounding tone A's separated by some sort of low G, but the low G should be quick. It's really easy to think about the burl being all about low G because the pinky's involved, but we're just trying to break up the airflow over that hole and not really hear a tonal low G. So in this one, we're gonna start on an E and it's gonna be the entire first beat. Then when that metronome clicks, we're gonna lower to an A. And in my case, I'm gonna sweep up across the hole and then down across the hole. Though you could also sweep down and curl back or even tap and curl back. There's a number of ways to do the burl. And there's a link in the description below for the method of burl that you should use based on your dexterity. I don't want to get into it all here. I'm just going to do the one I do. But again, the whole first beat is the E. And then we're going to separate that low A starting on the beat. And again, you'll hear not a ton of A left after a good clean burl. The next burl I want to discuss is the G grace note burl. This is going to be from an A to an A, but we're going to put that G grace note right on the beat. Again, that's going to be shaving the tiniest bit of the 
low A before to allow time for that grace note, closing that G grace note on the beat and then burling after the beat. By putting that G grace note in there, it allows us to hear all three of the A's in the burl. When we do the A to A burl here in just a moment, you'll see kind of what I'm talking about and how it changes for that. But for this one, with that G grace note, we'll do an A, G grace note to A1, some sort of sweep or motion over a low G for A number two, and then one more over the G for A number three. So in all of these, we were getting to that initial A on the beat with either a note change, like from E down to the A, or using a G grace note to get that first A on the beat. But what about the A to A burl? We can see this is the one example on this poster where the note before the beat actually extends past that line of color. In my experience, and as I talk about in my regular burl video, the A before the burl actually goes just past the beat because the initial A of the ornament is still present even if it's not written there. Now, many, many pipers, including me for much of my career, I just thought about pushing the A before the beat agogically, which means not in strict meter. I would push that A longer so that that burl wasn't early, but what I realized is what I really wanted to do was represent some of that initial A that's occurring on the beat. There's just nothing kind of indicating that it's happening. You'll see on screen right now how I would have written it out if it was up to me, but it's not, but it's still played that way. That little symbol you see there is called a tie, and it's meaning that we're holding that A across the beat into the first A of the burl that, in my opinion, should still be written there. It's not, we're stuck, everything's kind of where it is now. But you can see here, I've shown in the graphic that we're holding that A just past the beat before we get into the sweeps of the burl. If you're in doubt with this particular one as you're learning it, by all means, put that first sweep on the burl. That's how every other instruction book talks about it. But as you gain dexterity and speed in your burl, think about pushing it just past the beat as this diagram shows, or as we just discussed. And I think you're gonna find that your music just has a little bit more life and vibrance to it by pushing that burl off just a little bit. It also helps line up this burl with the other ones in this family where we were landing on an A from another note or emphasizing the first A with the G grace note and then sweeping our finger. We can see at the top of the tree there is a high G doubling. I haven't forgotten you. We are going to get to it. But first, let's go to the other side of the tree and discuss the embellishments that end on the beat. That means they're taking the time from beat number one and not beat number two. For this side of the tree, we're gonna start with a single grace note ornament, one I call a catch, though it's often just called a grace note. We're gonna talk in this case about the B low G grace note to A, or as I like to call it, the B low G catch to A. In this case, we're gonna be on B starting on the beat, and then we're going to put the low G before the beat, and this is a sounding tone low G. As you can see in the graphic that we're going to be on that low G for not an insignificant period of time. Now, we're not like camping out on it and making s'mores or anything, but we're not trying to make it as quick as possible. We want to hear a tonal G. It's important for it to have the gravity and feeling it needs. And that low G is taking away from the B, not the A we're landing on. So in this case, you're going to hear that that final note is going to be the longer of the two. And that initial note is going to be shorter because that's where we're subtracting the ornament from. There are many other catches that are possible on the instrument, but I'd say the next most common one is the high A F catch to G, sometimes again just called the high A F grace note to G. Same timing as the one we just did, we're going to be on high A, and then we're going to carve some time away to go to an F before we lift up to that high G to emphasize the high G. Again, you don't want the F to be too short, it is a sounding tone. We don't want it to be too long either, it's kind of one of those Goldilocks baby bear kind of situations.
Next, we'll discuss the grip. The grip is a great ornament. It really kind of gives a bra, brogue sound to your playing. I don't know of any other instrument that can kind of pull off that kind of sound like a Highland bagpipe. And this is one of the primary embellishments we use to do that. And the way we go about doing it is by playing two sounding tone low Gs separated by a D grace note, and that this ornament is subtracted from the note before, not after. In this example, we're gonna be doing a C, grip to a C. There are many, many other examples. Again, this video is not meant to be an exhaustive list of how to play them. This is more about how they're timed in our music. So again, you can hear we're having to carve quite a lot of time away from that initial C that we're starting with to give time to the grip, and then that the C we land on is actually quite long because there's nothing being subtracted from it in this case. I will say, when playing your grips, make sure you hear two good clear Gs. It's not just about you wanna hear da da. It could be a really quick da da, but it's something I aim for in my playing. Yes, like everybody, sometimes they don't come out as cleanly as I might like, but I am aiming to always hear two clear distinct low Gs in my grips. The other grip we need to discuss is the grip starting on D. Now for reasons, we're gonna separate this one with a B grace note right here, and we're going to use a tan colored grace note to represent this B grace note. That's your ring finger, and yes, it is by itself. Now you want to try to build your dexterity over time on a proper D grip. This should be a nice chirpy grace note, though at the beginning it's going to be bigger. That's just how it is but the timing is the same. We want to subtract all of the time, both Gs and that B grace note away from the D that we're starting with and not the note we're landing on, in this case, a low A. Yeah, work on the dexterity of that finger. It's kind of tough. Getting ready to wrap up this side of the tree, we're going to talk about the Taralua. The Taralua, very similar to the grip. The difference here being that we're going to need to get to the note we're landing on with an E grace note, emphasizing that final note we're landing on in a way that the grip doesn't do. For this example, we're going to be doing a low A to low A Taralua. So again, note, we're subtracting time away from that initial A, not the second A. It lands on the beat. This has caused many a headache for many a pipe major and many a band. But if the players can't play a good clean Taralua well and quickly, they're going to have to subtract more time from that initial note. So Taraluas can be quite tricky for beginning players trying to integrate themselves into a more advanced band where they can play their Taraluas more quickly because you can hear them starting into it early and then they often get yelled at. But I'm not sure what the other answer is because if they start it when everyone else is starting it, they're going to be going late because they're going to have no choice but to push it past the beat or crush the ornament entirely because they don't have the dexterity to pull it off at the speed like the rest of the band can. It may well be a good idea for those guys to do just a single tap on low G for a little while, like learn a simplified version and continue to work on their Tarlous to speed them up. You do what you need to in your band. I'm not trying to co-pipe major anybody, but it can and has been a problem for many a piper. I think we've all been yelled at for needing to hold that note before the Tarlua, which is true if you could play a good, clean, quick, crisp Tarlua. But if you hold that note before and your Tarlua is slow or you have to speed it to the point where it's a mess, that's not a good answer either. So practice a ton of Tarluas so you can get good, clean, quick, and fast with them. But like the grip, hear both of those low Gs, making sure to end it on the beat. The next Taralua we'll discuss is the one from D. Same rules as the grip from D. It's gonna have a B grace note rather than a D grace note. It is what it is. But as with the other Taralua, make sure that that E grace note is landing on the chirp of that metronome. Again, we're taking a lot of time away from the D before to make sure that we can get all of the bits of business of that Taralua in before the beat, and then that A we're landing on is gonna last its full beat.
that one's tricky. Cool, but tricky. And finally, we're going to talk about the Tarlua from Loji. Now, this is quite the odd animal. In many ways, it feels more like a doubling. But because it's in the Tarlua family, it's going to come before the B. So in this case, we're going to be on a low G. We're going to use that D grace note to go up to an A. Then separate that A with an E grace note, with that E grace note being the one that lands on the beat. And then finally, the full rest of the beat on the A afterwards. So it's going to sound, again, there's only one sounding tone in the middle of this, not two like the other grips and Tarluas. So it does feel quite a bit different. I've also been told that this could be another G. That's not how I was taught. Just be aware there might be another way to do it. For our purposes, we're going to use a low A is the sounding tone in our low G Tarlua. To wrap up this video, we're going to talk about the bottom and top of this tree. We're going to start with the light D throw. Now, this is an interesting ornament because it takes its time away from both sides. So I thought I'd make it the, the roots of the tree, if you will. So it's, it's kind of in both worlds, the before and after. And you can also see there are three sounding tones in this ornament rather than any proper grace notes. We're going to start on A, go down to a G I want to hear, a D I want to hear, a C I want to hear, to the final D. But yes, it is taking time away from both sides. That seems confusing, but in my experience, that's where people naturally want to put the beat in relationship to this ornament. This is a case of, we might be overthinking it a little bit, but hey, that's what this channel is all about. slow, fast, you want to hear all of the sounds. It's not, that'd be a D grace note to a C. It's not that, not for a light one. And it's also not a tap on C. Now for the heavy D throw, this one is, well, maybe the most confusing ornament on this entire page because it's written exactly the same when you look at the actual notes. But if you look at the piano roll underneath, there's an extra little bit of business in there. So for the heavy D throw, it's going to start the same. We're going to be on a low A in this case, heading down to a low G. We're on the same train so far, but this is where things diverge. For the heavy throw, rather than going up to a full D like we did in the light, we are going to do a D grace note, a single finger. And then we want a crossing noise to the C before we then lift to the D. So there's a crossing noise built in, but not written in. Now I have seen some books and other materials where the heavy D throws are written out with all four grace notes in there. The problem I have with that is it looks an awful lot like a Taralua. You can see there I'm comparing the two. It makes it very hard to read in real time. You're ultimately going to play whatever D throw you want to play when you see it. So rewriting it, I don't find particularly helpful and is, well, actually confusing. Let's see if I can demonstrate a relatively slow heavy D throw. This can be a harder one to demonstrate at slow speeds, but we'll give it a go. And then full speed. I tend to not teach it as a grip. Many other sources talk about a second low G as a full note. To me, that speeds up to sounding more like a grip to C lift to D. It's close to a heavy D throw, but that second low G being that heavy doesn't quite have the blah throw feel that you know I get out of my own throws or what I hear the other players out there on the boards doing. So finally, to end this thing, we have the high G doubling. Now, I did draw a direct line, the trunk of the tree, if you will, from the late D throw to this high G doubling because I would say these ones are related to each other. The high G doubling is a high G, an F, and a high G. And it's the same finger and motion as the 
second two thirds of a light D throw, which was the same finger going. It just doesn't have the initial low G, and I suspect strongly it doesn't have that because it doesn't need it. It's at the top of the scale, and you don't need to set it up with anything, though you could, but that's beyond what we need to talk here. We're going to be, in this case, on an E, and then on the beat, we're going to hit that high G, go down to an F, and then up to a high G. And the way I teach this, there are no grace notes per se. There are two sounding tones. We're going to be on an E, then on the beat, hit a high G, down to an F, and up to a high G, but I want to hear the tonality of each of those notes. It's a lighter embellishment. It kind of gives some variety to the music. We have many other crispy embellishments. It's nice to have a few that have a little bit more, well, lightness to them. Now I'm aware there are ornaments that I did not go over in this video, the dardo being one of the primary ones that you're going to run into. You'll see what that looks like right there. And there is a video below as well to learn how to play that one. I didn't include it because it's not always clear where this ornament falls in the beat. It's somewhat tune dependent and I've just been in too many situations where I've heard some people start it on the beat, some people start it before the beat and go across the beat, some people put nearly the entire thing before the beat. Since there's not one clear consensus about where it lands, I didn't include it here. There's also a number of other P-Brock embellishments, the Dre, the Edre, the Dare, the Cherre. That's, again, beyond the scope of this video. And, well, P-Brock doesn't really have a beat anyways. It's got a pulse. So there may well be a follow-up video where I talk about all the outlier embellishments that don't necessarily always follow something on a strict meter. That also includes the Roden, a lovely embellishment. It's very, very similar to the grip from D with that B grace note, though it tends to have a slightly longer grace note in the middle and is often coming from a C. But again, I've heard these timed in various places against the beat, so I didn't want to try to codify them onto one poster the way that these more accepted embellishments have been kind of chosen to fall where they do. And if you want your own copy of this lovely poster here, it's available in two wrapped canvases, either an 18 by 24 size, which is what I have here, or a 24 by 36 size that is quite large, people. But if you have a larger space or want to be able to read it from across the room, that might be helpful. But it's also available in the same 18 by 24 or 24 by 36 sizes, which are standard frame sizes. But be aware, it does not come in a frame if you need it pre framed, consider the wrapped canvas. It also goes down to a 9 by 11 size, which is perfect for the cover of a binder. Well, thank you so much for watching, everybody. If you got something out of the video, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. I wanted to give a really big shout out to everyone on my Patreon page. You'll see names now of folks scrolling up. These are folks that support the channel monthly. I'd love to add your name to this list. This poster between creating it itself, the research behind it, and getting all the videos prepared so I could even launch it has taken a lot of time. I appreciate everyone's patience, so thank you all so much. I'd love to have your support as well. I also teach Skype and online lessons. Go ahead and head over to www.commandyourbagpipe.com or email me at the address you see right here, and we'll get you going. I'm working with folks from all over the planet, and I hope to work with you soon. In addition to this poster, I have other bagpipe merchandise, like this lovely hoodie I have here. But I also have mugs and hats and t-shirts that have both the Command Your Bagpipe and the Prescription Bagpipe branding on them. So go ahead, check it out, and let the world know that you command your bagpipe. I hope you found this useful. Thank you again. I'm Matt Willis, and until next time, cheers.